Hey, well, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Dan Welch with Emerging Revolutionary War. Welcome back to another one of our uh, Rev War revelries here on a Sunday night series at 7 p.m. Uh, every two weeks. And tonight we've got a really interesting program. I uh, can't wait to share it with you. Tonight we're joined with several folks from the Friends of Miller House, uh, Washington headquarters. And we're going to dive into a little bit about George Washington uh, during the Battle of White Plains, the, the home uh, of the Millers that he will utilize as his headquarters during the battle. Talk a little bit about this site's unique history uh, and the preservation efforts over the last 200 years that have gone over there and uh, what you can go and see and visit uh, today. I'd like to introduce to you uh, our members tonight that are be joining us to share with us this history. Uh, first is Miss Briggs. Miss Briggs is the chairman of the Yorktown Heritage Preservation Commission and a member of the Board of Trustees for the Westchester County Historical Society and the Board of Directors for the Friends of Miller's House Washington headquarters. Uh, she's a former executive with Fortune 200 companies with domestic and international management experience. Also joining us this evening is Libby Del Greco. She's the board secretary of the Friends of Miller's House, Washington headquarter. Uh, she's worked as a fundraiser for nearly 15 years for the Wildlife Conservation Society at the Bronx Zoo and holds a degree in American Studies from Siena College. Uh, Libby is also a fellow alum of the Gettysburg semester fall 2005 at Gettysburg College. And finally joining us tonight is John Diaconis. I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, John. Perfect. Perfect. All right. Practice, uh, John practices in the area of insurance and uh, reinsurance claims and acts as an arbiter in, in reinsurance matters, having been certified by RES US. Uh, he has almost 30 years experience in the industry as both in-house and an outside counsel. Counsel, excuse me, received his JD from Drake University Law School, where he was a member of the Law Review and uh, is an LLM from New York University School of Law. So let's go ahead and get into it then this evening. We're talking about the Battle of White Plains. We're talking about things that are going on in New York in the fall of 1776. Uh, set it up for us. What's going on with the Continental Army, George Washington? What's going on with the British Army as we're looking into the month of October of 1776? So the... The Battle of White Plains could be considered, you know, the end of the campaign for New York uh, on the on the British side. Um, also, I just want to say ahead of time, thank you, Dan, for having us all here, and um, we're grateful for everybody's uh, time tonight. So, the uh, the New York campaign, of course, started in the summer of 1776, and I'm not going to, you know, bring everybody through the details about the Battle of Long Island, Kipps Bay, Howe's movements up the Hudson, and the like. But suffice to say that towards the late summer to early fall of 1776, Washington's army, as most of you know, was in a general retreat into um, what is now Westchester County as Howe's army made their way into the city and upriver. Um, at the suggestion of General Charles Lee, Washington decided to direct his armies to White Plains to effectively set up um, entrenchments because there were a series of natural hills in the area, which could uh, serve as natural defense sites. And also the city served as a continental supply depot for materials that were coming into the army to New York uh, from New England. So that's what brought him to White Plains at the time. Uh, upon his arrival, Washington set up entrenchments in the high grounds on the east and west banks of the Bronx River. I'm just gonna share um, a quick image here to help illustrate what I am speaking about. Okay. Um, so like I said, entrenching in the high grounds on the east and west banks of the Bronx River, which is effectively here. Um, he got to White Plains a few days before the British did. The British were waiting for more Hessian reinforcements at the time. So he had, and his troops had a good amount of time to really dig in and set up. So around October 22nd, they arrived and created these um, entrenchments. Uh, the one of particular interest is on what we call Chatterton Hill to the Southwest uh, in this area. When the British did arrive in the area on the 26th, uh, they 
attempted three attacks on Chatterton Hill. First two had minimal impact and might be considered unsuccessful, but the third was an attack on the right flank of the forces on Chatterton Hill, which drove the Continentals into a retreat. They retreated up what we now call Broadway up this way and entrenched themselves again on what we call Miller Hill and Mount Misery. Um, Howe's men attempted a small engagement against the forces that were entrenched on Miller Hill, but it was unsuccessful and eventually retreated back to New York City with its forces. Um, the Miller Hill battleground, as we call it, is actually one of the only battlefield sites in Westchester County that is still in its natural state. Um, the reason why this is important to me and my colleagues here on the board is because of this house, the Miller House. This house sits at the foot of Miller Hill and it was owned by Anne and Elijah Miller. The house was built in 1738. It predates the American Revolution, obviously, and it stood on the same site for nearly 300 years. And we happen to know that this site was a headquarters for Washington, at least in what we consider the latter half of the Battle of White Plains. Um, after the initial retreat and then the, the second stand. Um, the Miller family consisted of Elijah, uh, Anne, his wife, their seven children, Sarah, John, James, Elijah, Martha, Abraham, and Zephora. Uh, sadly, before the end of 1776, even before the Battle of White Plains, Anne and the family had suffered three significant losses. Her husband, Elijah, was killed at Hell's Gate in um, August of 1776, and her two, um, her two sons, John and Elijah, died of fever in camp in the summer of 1776. So when Washington and his men arrived, it was a female-run household, which we find really very interesting um, and something that we, we try to promote through our um, scholarship of the house. Um, we know that Washington was at the house on at least three occasions, the first being the time we're talking about, late October to early November of 1776 in the aftermath of the battle. In 1778, when the armies encamped at North Castle again, and then a final time in 1781, when French troops joined Continentals who were encamped in the area of White Plains before they began their march south to Yorktown. Um, These facts are recorded in a family history taking, taken by um, Zephora in 1845. Zephora stated that she recalled Washington being in the house. She recalled her mother actually giving up her bed, the only time she had ever done so for Washington when he stayed overnight. She recalled Generals Lee, McDougall, and Gates also being in the house from time to time and specifically recalled General Lee's advice that the family evacuate the home prior to the Battle of White Plains because they would have a troublesome time uh, if they stayed. The house has many amazing stories attached to it. Um, the recollections of, recollections of the girls um, interacting with General Lee and General Washington. Um, and it plays an important role in the history of Westchester County in the revolution, which we also find uh, really, really interesting. So going back to the, the, the Battle of, of White Plains, um, <clears throat> this is a battle that unfolds after a, a, a summer of just um, ups and downs for the American cause. Uh, you know, we're, we're thinking that we're just three months now after the American, or excuse me, the Declaration of Independence. Um, you know, the war is, although still in its infancy, we've seen early successes by uh, by, you know, the Continentals. We've also seen some defeats. Um, and now here we are at White Plains, um, Washington's first defensive line, as you were talking about, um, is outflanked um, by British forces. They're forced to fall back to um, Miller's Hill. Uh, the battle comes to an end. You know, the, the, the Continentals are able to, to hold that position. Um, what's Washington's next move? What what is he deciding there at, at his headquarters at the Miller property following this battle? Obviously, you know, resupplying his men, tending to the wounded, um, you know, policing the battlefield are all immediate concerns. But what, 
What's Washington think of next? You mentioned that he's going to stay there for a little bit of time after the Battle of White Plains. Um, what are the, the next plans for, for General Washington in the fall of 18, or 1776? His next steps are going to be continuing an orderly retreat. Um, eventually, he will cross the army at Peekskill um, as, as he gets into the winter. So Washington then packs up from his headquarters. The army will, will continue its retreat then and, and move off. What, what happens to you know, this property? You talk about the Miller House. You talk about all these other moments in the American Revolution where armies continually find themselves, commanders continually find themselves back in this particular part of, of the county. What makes this such a critical route, if you will, uh, in this area of New York that we're seeing a lot of activity both from the Continental and British soldiers uh, in the vicinity of White Plains? I think in, uh, in general, Washington's overall strategy being to, um, well, in response to Howe's strategy to cut off the, the Northern colonies, Washington knows how critical the Hudson Valley is, um, how critical protecting the Hudson Valley is and the connection to the New England colonies. Um, uh, at this time, there's, there's so much Revolutionary War history in Westchester, you know, and uh, the Hudson Valley, including West Point, um, including um, everything we know about the John Andre affair. This is this is a hotbed of um, of interesting stories. And one of the most interesting parts of it is that the Hudson Valley it was considered considered neutral ground there because it was so close to New York and so close to the New England colonies. You had loyalists and you also had rebels, if you will, often in the same town. Um, so as much as they tried to, to trumpet neutral ground, it was really a hotbed on either side. Um, and I think that breeds uh, drama. And I think it also breeds um, change. And uh, with change comes stories. So I, I think that's, um, that's why so much happened there. Uh, one of the other, I think one of the other reasons that they that the uh, Patriots congregated at Miller House is because it was safe. It, it was, it was, it's very high up on, on a hill and you look down on the rest of, uh, of White Plains. And I think it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's a safe place. And I think that's why uh, Howe retreated because he didn't think he would survive. You know, just, uh, could you, Libby, could you go back to um, sure. the, 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 the first slide with the with the map of uh, White Plains. As uh, those of you watching us as, as we pull up yeah. this map again, uh, you know, feel free to ask any questions in the chat uh, for our panelists this evening as we go through the program. Uh, a lot of new interesting uh, stories we're going to hear this evening that you might want to know a little bit about. But I, I send it back now to John to talk to us a little yeah. bit more about uh, the uh, geography at White Plains. Right. Well, right, exactly. So if, this is Chatterton's Hill that uh, that uh, Libby referred to, and that was one of the battles that were there. And I think after the third charge, the uh, British took it over. The uh, there is a uh and this is the bronx i think the bronx river is is here there's a uh right now if you visited the white plains there's a a uh there's a a, tr a rail a train rail here it's called the the uh harlem line it goes literally straight up this way straight up so it it's to the right of chatterton's hill and there's this is Main Street of White Plains. You probably can't see where I'm, where I'm pointing, but if you that red, those red, that red area is is um, is Main Street. My office, right where that cursor is, is um, there's a is right across the street from the train station, and there's a large black building there that, that where I sit every day and <laughs> look over at, Ch at Chatterton Hill. Uh, if you go, so th there's, um, then if you look north, you can see the hills. There's, there's one hill, then there's a, a second hill, and then that third hill up in where, where North Castle, where it says North Castle, is where uh, 
is where the Miller is where the Miller house is. So it gets it gets higher, higher, and higher as you go up. And I think that he, you know, he re, he retreated and retreated until he got to the point where it's it's basically it's 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 very difficult to get there if you're gonna if you're under fire. And I and I had, I believe that the last even above the Miller house, there's there's, a, there's another hill called Miller Hill. That's where the battlefield is that Libby referred to, and I think that the the last uh, our artillery round was fired from Miller Hill to Howe. And at that point, I decided, I've got New York City. What do I need to mess around with? Uh, uh, my objective is, is complete. So that's when he retreated to, uh, to New York. But if, you, if you're going to visit uh, the area, there's, there's a couple hotels right around here. There's a Ritz Carlton, some decent restaurants. And you're, I guess, Today, like it was 200 years ago, you're literally in the middle of Westchester County. So you can be in New York City if you want to go to that godforsaken place. You can be there in 35 minutes. Or if you want to go north, you can be in, um, uh, in other areas of, uh, of the county and see other um, Revolutionary War sites relatively quickly. So White Plains is a is, is is very centrally located and just if i could believe if you could go to the next slide of the miller house i just wanted to mention one other thing if you see that large tree on the left it's a sycamore tree and it's uh, over 300 years old and it was there when uh, the battle occurred um and the soldiers we are told would um uh, sit under the shade of that tree uh, when they were resting. And if you, you notice how close it is to the house, the roots were actually um, uh, affecting the, the foundation of the house and the, pri the county, you know, they wanted to cut it down. In fact, they were, they were about to cut it down. And um, we ultimately, I guess, the, it wasn't just the friends, but a lot of people put pressure on the, on the county not to, not to cut the tree down. So it's been preserved. And it's interesting that the window right next to that tree is where the, where the, um, where the bedroom is that Washington slept mm -hmm. when he was at the Miller house. So. And, you know, and, I, and that's the story that I want to transition to in just a moment, um, John. But before we talk a little bit about what happens with the site afterwards, um, if we could go back to the battle for just a moment, um, you know, when we talk about the Battle of White Plains, talk to us a little bit about, you know, the size of the armies that are on the field, um, you know, how each commander views the, the results of this, win, loss, um, casualties involved. If you could tell us a little bit more about the, you know, the, the outcomes of the engagement, if you will. So the Americans had about 3,000 um, troops on the ground for this engagement. The British had anywhere between 7,500 and uh, 12,000, depending on uh, which, which citation you look at. And if you count Hessians, uh, there was a major, major contingent of um, Hessians that had been added to the British regulars um, for this battle. In terms of casualties, they were what one might call light, you know, maybe 500 combined, uh, pretty evenly split between uh, the Americans and the British side. I personally think that it's a bit of a draw, but as happened many times, you know, Washington pulls British engagements to a draw, and then the British sit on their hands a bit, and Washington's able to um, retreat in a, a more northerly, but, you know, ordered fashion. So I don't count it you know, even though the, the British were able to drive the Americans from Chatterton's Hill, as John was pointing out, even though that was a, a successful drive, I don't, I don't believe that Washington would have counted it as a loss because he came out of it all right, if you will. They were able to retreat, they were able to resupply and retreat across the river and set up a, uh, you know, those successful campaigns through Trenton and uh, Princeton that I know your readers, excuse me, our listeners know so much about. So even though this was, you wouldn't call it a, a victory on either side, it wasn't a loss, um, at least not for the Americans. 
merely because the British didn't capitalize as we've seen before and living to fight another day gave us the the triumphant end of 1776 that, that we all know. Yeah, I think it's a great point it, is that, you know, the, the fighting here and this, this battle of White Plains really sets up um, the events that are going to happen towards the end of the year 1776 in Trenton and Princeton and, and these triumphant victories that Washington pulls out in New Jersey. And one of the things you mentioned was, you know, the new addition of some of these Hessian units with Howe's army at the Battle of White Plains, several commanders of which, including uh, uh, Johann or John Rawl and, and Carl von Donat, uh, we'll, see, we'll see them in action in the story at Trenton and Princeton. Um, one of the questions we had come into the chat is if you could kind of move the cursor around on the, on the map and the, uh, the proximity of where the Miller House is located during the battle. Right, so it, it is in the, what we call North Castle. Um, as it stands now, North Castle is a, a separate town from White Plains, but at the time it was, you know, all a general space. Um, this is about, uh, I apologize for the poor scale of the map. This is probably between five and six miles north of Chatterton Hill, where the initial engagement was. Um, there's a lot of very interesting I'll call it debate in Westchester County over the, the headquarters for Washington during the battle. There is a house that was located very close to uh, the Chatterton Hill area, they call the Purdy House. And, um, you know, there's a lot of a lot of debate that, you know, the Purdy House was really the headquarters because that's closer to the main engagement. My personal interpretation from what I've read and from um, commentary that I've read is, sure, Purdy was probably a headquarters in the early days, October 22nd, 23rd, 24th, when Washington was understanding the layout of White Plains, when he was understanding where he wanted his men entrenched. But then as the engagement became evident that the British were marching more north um, from uh, New Rochelle. I don't know if anybody knows the Westchester area, but they came up via New Rochelle from the eastern side of the county as that, in, um, the word I want is escaping me, but as the battle became evident and then with the subsequent retreat, Miller House became the, the headquarters. So there's no reason it, it can't be uh, two important places in, in the battle. And we have evidence that Washington was at both. Yeah, and I guess that's kind of the story that I want to transition to. So this, you know, you've got this, the, the history of the family, the family's uh, stories of what's happened there, not only in October of 1776, I mean, the litany of, of, uh, of what will become Revolutionary War illuminaries or notaries that at one point visit this, this site, the Miller House, or use it as a headquarters or meet there. Um, you know, you'd be hard pressed to find many other locations uh, you know, that are still standing today from the American Revolutionary War era, where all of these uh, notables will, will later uh, visit or stay for an extended period of time. So that's kind of the story that I want to transition to now. The battle's over. Um, Howe pulls back. Washington uh, is, is getting ready to move as well as it's moving towards the early days of November of 1776. Um, Time marches on. The war shifts theaters. It moves into New Jersey for a while, and, and then the war will continue to play out in other areas uh, of the 13 colonies. But what happens to the family that, that's there, uh, the Millers, and kind of what, what goes on uh, during the duration of the war, and uh, what do we see in the post-war era that, that leaves us with this, this fantastic place to come and visit and and really this touchstone of American history. What's the story of, of the Millers and, and the property there that you all interpret and preserve? So the, the Miller family remained on the property. Um, Anne, uh, uh, Elijah's wife, she lived in the house until 1819 uh, at, at her death and her eldest daughter lived in the house until 1838. Um, it remained a, a working farm it remained a. It remained known in um, writings and, and interviews as a place that had been Washington's headquarters. And at some point, I believe, uh, John, it was it was sold to the county or to a, a nonprofit. Yeah. The, the Daughters of the American Revolution, the AR, acquired it uh, at some point. Uh, 
uh, and operated it for many, many years until 1917, uh, at which point they sold it to the county. And um, I guess after the war, the, um, well, during the war it was used, aside from being a place that, uh, uh, that other officers met uh, and uh, was apparently a very strong woman and she uh, allowed to has to be used as a, as a hospital for people that were uh, for soldiers that were injured. And I, we also uh, uh, know that the, uh, I guess she started the Methodist or one of the first, the, the first Methodist uh, service was held in the house. Um, uh, so th those were two, two other notable events that occurred uh, during the war and shortly, shortly thereafter. But the county, county acquired the house in 1917 from DAR and has owned it, owned it since then. So one of the one of the things that that your organization has done uh, in recent years, the Friends of, of Miller House, is to not only preserve the house itself and, and preserve these stories uh, from both you know uh, the military aspect of of the site's um, history, but also the, the civilian effect of of the war in that sector of of New York. Um, you know, with that comes a lot of of research and. And uh, you know, digging through repositories and finding, you know, accounts of of this location. You know, what are some of the the research into this site? Um, you know, some interesting tidbits of research. Some of the new things that that you all have discovered that you're bringing to the forefront. Um, you know, what what is some of those engaging aspects of the story of the Miller House that have really surfaced as as your group has worked to preserve and interpret the site? You know, I. I think that uh, the don't we have it we in the in the ten years that the friends have been uh, organized have not uh, uh, learned anything new. Um, our efforts were were largely uh, to uh, pressure uh, to. Uh, persuade prior administrations to uh, refurbish the house because it had fallen into disrepair, disrepair and it had been closed for about 20 years. So that was our first charge. It was, it, it's only, it was only uh, uh, renovated uh, three years ago. Well, the renovation started about three years ago and they were finished about a year and a half ago. Uh, the house was open for a brief period of time um, and then it was closed due to COVID. So our second role, uh, now, that, now that the house had been renovated, it was to assist the county in doing programming. So we've 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 had some pro we've had several programs thanks to both Libby and Lynn over the last year, um, and there is research that we're doing that Lynn Lynn is uh, involved with now, uh, with respect to the house. Um, but, but uh, as I said, there's nothing new that we've, that we've discovered, but the other, you know, interesting things about the house were, you know, the fact that it was used as a, um, as the Methodist church's first service. We, we know that the, the, uh, Miller family is, is buried close by, um, in, in the first Presbyterian church. Um, we know that the sycamore tree was used. For for um, it's still standing and it was used for shade, and um, we know General Lee was uh, the last day of his court martial was there. Um, we didn't discover that, but we yeah. Um, but those those are some of the interesting things that that we that we know have happened. Uh, and the house was mostly uh, post nineteen seventeen used. For, uh, as a school, uh, as a destination for school trips for, mm. for kids, and um, where they learned, you know, the, the names of the family members and what had happened there, and that's another thing that we hope to get going again. Um, one of the the new fresh opportunities that the the renovation of the house 
uh, has the repair and renovation, I'll say, that the house has brought us is um, the county created a new educational center right on grounds that we didn't have before. So in the past, it was simply this fabulous 18th century farmhouse, but now we have a fully, um, fully dry, fully enclosed um, site right there where we hope to be able to do programs uh, in the future. It's got restrooms, it's got, you know, IT, it's, there's parking for school buses, there's all sorts of stuff. Um, and we're, we're very excited to have it, but we can't quite enact on it yet because of the restrictions with COVID. But one thing that is really feeding what we're going to be able to do at the house is the work that Lynn has been doing with our partners at the Westchester Community College. Um, their historical interpretation certificate, is that what it's called, Lynn? Has been yes, doing thanks, some, uh, thanks. some pretty cool stuff. Yeah, thank you, Libby. Um, we discovered last year a new, what I'll call specialty offering. It's called the Historic Preservation Curriculum at Westchester Community College. And what it is, is a four course curriculum where anyone, and we use the word student researchers, most of these students are not, they're well past their professional careers and looking for other career opportunities actually, but they can engage in a four course curriculum where they get a certificate and it's called the, the preservation certificate. It allows them to be employed using that in museums or cultural heritage organizations and whatnot. And we've had the good fortune to partner now with six of those students. And um, we've done all kinds of things like build landmark applications and build the history of potential landmarks too, for example, and John talked about this. One of the students we had did an artifact analysis of uh, the things that were in the Miller house during Washington's uh, and Mrs. Miller's occupying it during the Battle of White Plains. So, they presented, she presented it recently to the Miller House and a broader audience of people. So um, what we intend to do, and one other thing we're doing, which is quite interesting, is um, we're working on, I think I told you earlier, Dan, that uh, we have an effort underway, a, a sub-initiative under Revolutionary West Chester 250, which is to really understand the whole Andre Arnold treason affair. And two of these students are literally going community to community, and there are probably 30 of them involved and assessing what physical markers may be in those communities and what was the historic event that was part of the Andre Arnold affair. And we're doing this inventory of those cities, their communities, I should say, with an eye toward saying, all right, what's there, what's not? And can we get an integrative uh, network of, of physical objects together to pull together the whole Andre Arnold story? So with an overlaid audio digital tour, you can start this, you know, site one and go through all the whole set of cities in the end and understand what happened in each place and what was the point of interest. So that's one of the things that we would love to maybe tee up with you and see if there are collaboration or research opportunities through this mechanism we have in place. And maybe there's an opportunity to further build out um, content at your site or our, our sites. Maybe there's an opportunity to drill down on certain personalities or people involved in this. For example, we, we really wanna have a better understanding of the enslaved uh, who are involved, Native Americans, and uh, a lot of the personalities just because I'm pre a little prejudiced right now to the Andre Arnold story, the women, the children who are involved in those efforts. So that's what I wanted to tee up with you. What are your thoughts on where you think we might work together in terms of either content or personality or research or writing. We love the idea to be mentored by any of you in writing, especially being able to take what we're learning and build you know, pieces of literature for it or publish it in various venues. So let me pause here and get your thoughts on this. Well, it it's definitely sounds like there's a lot left of the story to, to uncover up there. And I know we've got some folks that were uh, commenting at the beginning of the program from where they're from that might want to, to reach out and get involved with uh, all of your exciting research going on out there. I do need to pause for a moment. We have some questions that have come in that I want to, uh, to pose to the panelists. One of the questions that came in is in regards to uh, Washington's operations uh, up in White Plains. Question is, um, did Washington order the Americans to seize the boats? on the east side of the Hudson, much like he did during his time on the Delaware. Anybody have a- Run that by me, that? what was that again? Did he- Did uh, Washington what? order the Americans to seize the boats on the east side of the Hudson, much like he later did on the Delaware? 
Do you mean prior to the crossing to Peekskill? Mm, I'm Ooh. assuming so. The question doesn't say what what point in this part of the, the the campaign, if you will. He's not. They're not talking about the evacuation from Brooklyn into Manhattan, are they? Because if if they are, I think that that was. I think he. I don't know if he ordered, but he. Everyone gathered every boat that was available to go to Brooklyn and when they scaled down the Brooklyn Heights to go into Manhattan, but yeah. uh, not aware my, of what happened yeah, my, up in the- uh, I, I haven't studied that closely, if, but that's my impression that there was a, you know, all hands on deck, if you will, to uh, secure any passage they could across that evening. Mike, if you're still watching, if you could let us know at what point in the campaign you're you're talking about so we can further follow up for you. Uh, another question that we got in is, is a couple of folks kind of get into a debate a little bit about the outcome of the Battle of White Plains and whether or not it's it's a, a continental victory or it's a British victory. We have some folks that are that are saying that this was definitely a British victory. They tactically retained the, the battlefield following the Battle of White Plains, and then they will later strategically force uh, Washington's Continental Army uh, to retreat from the area. Um, other folks are saying that it's 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 not an outright clear-cut British victory. That you know Washington's army is able to retreat. They are able to regroup later in Pennsylvania. So it might not be a you know a, a very clear-cut outcome. Any comments on on the discussion that's happening in the chat? I, let me take a crack at that. I, you know, you know, it's kind of a mixed bag. I think I, I, it's a British, it's it's an American victory to the extent that they didn't get annihilated and they they survived to fight another day. Um, it was a British victory. When Howe thought, why do I need to lose any more men? He probably was thinking what happened in. Breeds Hill, I've got Manhattan. That was really my objective. So let me retreat. Um, so I, I, you know, I think it's more real, realistic to say what, rather than label it as a victory for one side or a defeat for the other, just acknowledge what happened. The, the Continental Army survived. Uh, the British, uh, they weren't annihilated by the British. The British. Uh, retreated but their objective their main objective was that, that they drove washington out of manhattan and they they had control of new york city at that point and for the rest of the war um i completely agree with you john my reflection you know victory is a broad term right one interpretation might be to say that a victory in a battle is um the side that's left with the most choices at the end of the day Right, someone whose hand is not forced. If you take that, you know, definition, then maybe, maybe it's how he could have pursued. He elected not to. He elected to, you know, as John said, cut his losses and understand the the benefits and the strengths that he still had. Whereas Washington only had one way to go. That said, Washington still had the ability to go that way. So, it's it's a very subjective term, um, but I, it's not a, a a clear cut black and white answer, I think. Yeah, in the, the discussion going on right now in the chat, I think is is really interesting talking about how historical hindsight ties into that, right? You know, obviously Washington at, at headquarters at the Miller House doesn't know that the next decisions after this battle will, will eventually lead to a fatal end for the, you know, the British Army, a large majority of the British Army at Yorktown. Um, but I do want to get back to that earlier question. There was a clarification about the boats. It's in regards to peak skill. Uh, regarding the boats, you know, what did Washington, in fact, order all the boats rounded up um, in regards to the Hudson River and, and the crossing at Peekskill? Um, I don't know the answer to that. I, I haven't uh, done any reading about that particular crossing. Um, Lynn, John, have have you? I don't I don't know the answer to that question either. No. That's an interesting one uh, that you've, you've got our panel tonight, Mike. I appreciate the, the question. We'll have to dig deeper into that and see uh, if, if Washington does indeed order the boats seized. Uh, one of the things that uh, I think all of uh, you, your work at the, the Miller House has really done is, is to highlight, um, you know, this 
this small but important moment um, in 1776. You know, not only are you interpreting this particular site, this, this headquarters facility, the home of these people throughout the war, but um, being able to uh, get it open again for folks to come and visit. Um, you know, Lynn was talking about the, the number of opportunities to continue to research uh, the campaign and the battle around White Plains, uh, as well as for many of our audience tonight, the huge amount of interest in the, the Andre Arnold story that is taking place in your county and, and, and around this area throughout the war. How do folks get involved? How do we get to your site? Um, how do we hear more about the story? How do we get involved? Well, let me, at the, there's a Revolutionary Westchester uh, website, number one. There's a Revolutionary Westchester org site, Facebook site. So, and then we have two Miller, we have the Facebook page for Miller House and a website for Miller House. But short of that, you can email Libby and or John or me. And uh, I think you've got our email addresses and we'll try to directly contact whoever's interested to work with them. I'd love to talk to Billy Griffith um, based on our earlier conversation and see if we can't hook up. So uh, there you go. Oh, and we'll give anybody who is on this, if you can prove that you're on this uh, Zoom, we will we will give you a personal tour of the Miller House. We'll, we'll get it open and we'll take you through the house. Uh, I will even take you out for a beer afterwards. <laughs> well, for the, There's a couple of bars that are close by. Um, those, those of us that have been with Emerging Revolutionary War for a long time, we are a, a fan of, of going out for beers and talking history. So there you go. You, so you, uh, you can't pass up uh, a better opportunity to, to get with these folks, learn a little bit more about the battle, uh, the Miller House. There's some ways to, to get in touch with those folks. I, I want to thank uh, all of us uh, panelists that were here this evening, Libby and Lynn and John, for all the work that you've been doing to, to preserve this location, to preserve this story uh, so crucial in the fall of 1776. Uh, join us for our next ERW Revelry just two weeks from now on December the 26th. We're going to do a kind of a unique program. We're going to do a live watch party of the movie, The Crossing. So you can see uh, legendary yeah. Jeff Daniels as uh, George Washington. Watch it with uh, us live. We'll have our historians, uh, Kevin Pollack and Mark Malloy uh, on with us commenting about the, the historical accuracies or inaccuracies of the film. Uh, you may even hear some of our historians quoting uh, word for word, some of their favorite scenes throughout. Yeah. So uh, we'll see you all again in two weeks on December the 26th at 7 p.m. In the meantime, everyone have a safe, happy, and healthy holiday season. Thanks again. We'll see you real soon. I'm Dan Welch with Emerging Revolutionary War. Have a good evening. Thank, Thank you, Dan. You.